Welcome again. It's good to have you here as we are uh, working our way through the book of Revelation. And Hugo, how's things going? Things are going uh, all right. So uh, we uh, just, uh, well, you know, the, the for us at least, the holiday season is coming and all that kind right. of stuff. So, so. What, when you're watching this, we are recording it just after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Did you and eat anything? Did I eat anything? Yeah. What do you mean, did like, I eat anything? I mean, how much I made, did you eat? I ate too much. You ate too much? Okay. We had to All freeze right, most enough. of the turkey. Yeah, though. no, that's always the case. And you have, yeah. like, you know, You might see forever. it some Sunday night. <laughs> <our hangout. laughs> of course I will. <laughs> but um, <laughs> turkey enchiladas, here they come. <laughs> It's smoked turkey. It's pretty good. Oh, that is pretty good. So Anyway, so we're here in Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 6 today, and we're going to be looking at the opening of the seals mm -hmm. by the Lamb. And the first four uh, specifically are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, mm -hmm. as they have been called. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we'll get to the fifth seal and the opening of the sixth. So we're in Revelation 6. I don't think we're getting any farther than that today. Mm -mm. And this is probably where things start getting a little more... Um, Symbolic, maybe? No, they've been... Yeah. Well, that's yeah. fair, but like... But um, more uh, dicey, juicy, mm -hmm. um, ooh, you well, know, I think intrigue. also what a lot of people focus on, you know? Yeah. It's like, what did these mean, you know? Right. But... All of this is after and only after and only because the central revelation, as we've talked about in this, is the revelation of mm -hmm. God on his throne in chapter 4 and the Lamb who is worthy because of his death and resurrection, the Lamb who was slain. Mm -hmm. So he looked, or he is called a lion, mm -hmm. but John sees a lamb. Okay? Yeah. And so... Um, and so it is that Jesus Christ is the one who now is able to open the seals. And the seals, as we talked about, are the prophetic message. Um, you know, we saw that in Isaiah last time. Right. That Isaiah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the words were sealed up because people didn't understand them, wouldn't mm -hmm. believe them out of unbelief. They wouldn't uh, understand it. But they also, Jesus unseals basically the plan and direction in the future for the kingdom of God through his death and resurrection now a whole new way is open and it is moving in that direction whether it looks like it or not mm -hmm. which I think in this you know coming chapter is definitely going to be like wait what what is happening right and this definitely doesn't seem like it is God's plan and yet it is only descriptive of mm -hmm. what the world really is I mean this uh, chapter 6, uh, the vast majority of it, the people, well, the people that read this first mm -hmm. in the first century into the second century would understand it completely mm -hmm. because these things were going on right then. Right. And um, they are going on today. Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. Um, so why don't we actually just jump right in? And, jump uh, right in and start with prayer? Yeah. And then, okay. And then we'll just open it from there. All right. Go ahead, Hugo. You do it. All righty. Father, um, thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, come together tonight and to um, just to have a look again at your word, uh, Revelation. It is a, uh, a difficult book, and I think right now we're going to be talking mm -hmm. about a particular passage that a lot of people are very familiar with, um, but might still be uh, confusing. And there's a lot to actually unravel here. So um, give um, us uh, the wisdom and the spirit to uh, speak only what you want us to say. That it's not of our own understanding or our wisdom, but that it, it is only from the spirit that actually uh, uses us right now to just untangle, hopefully a little bit, this passage. Um, we pray this in the name of Christ alone. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hugo. Mm -hmm. So you can turn with us now to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to read, um, I guess, uh, let's see, let's read, the. I guess, the whole chapter? Uh -huh. No, let's just, j let's just read uh, 1 through 11. 1 through 11? Yeah, that's enough, because um, actually good. it might, yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. 
and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that the people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures uh, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they uh, were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who uh, were to be killed as they themselves had been. All right. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to just uh, stop there for this chapter right now and kind of get into these four horsemen specifically to talk mm -hmm. about, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I think that uh, we need to understand um, something about these four. Okay. okay? Yeah. So each of these, um, as Eugene Peterson says, each of these evils is common, but each is also disguised so that we're, we culturally accept its presence as something normal, even good. Now, uh, the four horsemen, I think, are best understood as the mm -hmm. first being kind of authoritarianism. Okay. Um, trying to control, you know, going out to conquer, mm -hmm. um, basically using force to get things done in this world in one form or another. Okay. The second is war itself, you okay. know, yeah, with yeah. the sword, right? Yeah. The third um, is kind of interesting, the black horse. Because it's basically famine in one sense, but um, we'll talk about that a little more. The mm -hmm. inequities, though. There are wine and oil, plenty of. Mm -hmm. Barley and wheat, necessities, not much of. Right. Interesting. Yeah, huh? you'll have to tell me what uh, what that actually means and all that. Right. Stuff. The denarius, because I'm like, I don't know what that means. A denarius so. is a day's wage. So okay. just think today, if you work um, eight hours in a day, mm -hmm. let's just say $15 an hour. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, that's a uh, hundred and wow. That's not a that wow. So um, grain is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but wine and oil, no problem. Yeah. Huh. Uh, hey. Okay. And then finally, sickness or the fourth horse is the pale horse. Mm -hmm. It's death. Um, it can be sickness. It can be a disease. Um, and often these four things are disguised in different ways. Um, as well in our world. So, um, but let's start with um, let's let's look at first this first horse. Sure, okay? the white one. Okay. The white one. Now, what's interesting is um, it says he opened one of the seals and heard one of the four living creatures and the rider and uh, behold a white horse. Now, when you think of a white horse, often or white mm -hmm. in this book, remember symbolically white means like purity or something. Right. Like that, you so know? this one's been confusing. A lot of um, interpreters in the past um, say, hmm, wait a minute, there's another place in the uh, book of Revelation. Is there? Okay. Yes. Revelation 19, where there's another horse named um, and that is uh, slide six, by the way. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, why ah, don't yeah, you okay. read that sure. and see um, about this horse and who the rider is on this. Oh, okay. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting uh, on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, 
were follow, uh, following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron, uh, with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Okay, so this is in another um, cycle in the book of Revelation. Okay. Uh, but who's the white horse and the rider? Well, it seems to be Jesus. Yeah. yeah, 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 it is. And we'll get to that later. But what's interesting in that uh, vision mm -hmm. is it's pretty clear that it, you know, he's called faithful and true, the King of Kings and right. Lord of Lords. Um, uh, he doesn't carry a, uh, he, his mouth has a sword coming at it, which mm -hmm. is the word of God. Um, he doesn't have a weapon of war. He's not militaristic. Right. Right. Which you see with like the uh, the red horse has like he's a given sword. a great sword. And you know? the white horse in this instance, he's given a bow, yeah. an arrow. Yes. Yeah, so... Right. So it just and here's the problem with this interpretation. Oh, he's so the first horse that goes out is uh, Jesus. The kingdom of God expands and conquers the world. Um, it can be an interpretation, but mm -hmm. I think the problem is all four horses seem to be equal. Right. Um, none of them seem to be superior to the others. Mm -hmm. This in Revelation 19 is the only time there's another white horse, and right. it is unique, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah so that's that true. that would be kind of interesting that um, John would see a vision where Jesus is just one of four. Yeah, it's kind of weird yeah. because he's never actually described as one of any kind of sense. No, he's always, always uniquely unique. alone. And then secondly, is you never see anywhere in the scriptures where Jesus has, like, a weapon of war. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe, like, his, you know, again, the, the sword, sword of it, But that but is symbolic you know? for um, the word of God, yeah. Right. And, um, and so the bow is just really interesting. So I think it's better to understand the first horse differently, and this is what Lewis Brighton, uh, the one commentary, says. This is um, the next slide. Okay, okay? gotcha. Um, the interpretation... That best fits the description of this first horseman and his role is that of a spiritual evil that causes military tyrannical dominance. That is, the rider of the white horse symbolizes and represents every form of tyranny, which is won and acquired by power and force, usually warfare or forms of it, and which, when then by a dictatorial rule, exploits, enslaves, dominates, and terrorizes. It can take the classical form of triumphant militarism and the lust of conquest which makes great empires. However, it also refers to any human entity, institutional or individual, lawful or unlawful, which misuses its authority to exert tyranny over its subjects. Tyranny often justifies its dominance by a claim of divine or quasi-divine authority, hence the horse's color of white. It will use force of arms, of mind, of wealth, or of any other resource to establish its authority and the exercise of it, hence the bow. Okay. I think that's a better explanation for this horse in this instance. And then the others that follow it fit much mm -hmm. better. And just think of it, you know, often, and I've seen this um, in world history, and I think you, when you study world history, you see mm -hmm. how um, some divine claim is made mm -hmm. Um, well, yep. the Roman Empire itself, mm -hmm. you know, that the emperors became divin divine gods in themselves. Right, right. And the whole Pax Romana, you know, the peace of Rome, oh, yeah, it yeah, looks yeah. like it's so wonderful, but mm -hmm. it was all through military force and mm -hmm. subjugating people and enslaving them. Yep. So um, I think authoritarianism also disguises itself often as safety and security, you know, we're doing this for the masses. Right, 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 right. Um, a lot of our dystopian literature and movies, <laughs> you know, like the Hunger Games and all, mm -hmm. man, I mean, these four horsemen fit into it that like crazy, don't they? Yeah, I'm also, uh, oh, wow, I'm also thinking of um, uh, the book 1984, um, mm. pretty classic one, where yeah. they're like, one of the things that they needed all the time was to have a... Uh, you know, a war against another people. I forget the, uh, the particular people, but, um, you know, that's... To keep it going. Yeah, to have uniformity uh, in them. So war was a necessity in that s society, or at least according to the leaders, in order to, you know, right. uniform everyone to keep them, I guess, in, in their place. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so, and um, if you haven't noticed in this world right now, there's a lot of forms of authoritarianism um, going around. 
<laughs> what? No. And there's a lot of justifications for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so just recently, Nicaragua has had a new election. Okay. And, you know. And, How did that go? Well, it's the same old, same old That's there. Fair enough. And um, they basically forced, um, you know, all the other oppositions not to be able to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. And then basically claiming divine right in some form. Right. I mean, we can go to a classic one we uh, mentioned before, mm -hmm. I think, and that is uh, in Nazi Germany, the Third Reich mm -hmm. was called the Third Reich mm -hmm. because it was the third reign, the third millennium mm -hmm. uh, idea of the reign of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so they were using kind of a divine sanction mm -hmm. for what they were doing, which, which is absolutely yeah. absurd. Which is interesting that it's like, you know, like a lot of people, you know, go for it. If a lot of people really, like, were really into the Nazism and things like that, there's a reason why, because, you know, some people that were actually going along with it might have thought this was legitimately the third reign of Christ. Right. It's in the name, you know? Right. And uh, so, uh, and triumphant militarism or mm -hmm. militaristic nationalism or even like a religious nationalism mm -hmm. that happens in nations. And we're seeing that around the world. And sadly, I've even seen it here in the United States mm -hmm. where some sanction of force and coercion is used for the sake of. Right, peace or uniformity, safety, security, or uniformity, right. nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, we got so, but it's quote normal, and we treat it as normal. So what's interesting in the Book of Revelation, and I guess I don't have it down here. I must have um, when uh, John or any apocalyptic writer wants you to understand that these are just kind of normal things that are going on. They use more or less symbols that are found already in nature, like the horse. Okay, yeah. But when they want to say, hey, there's something greater than what's natural, what's greater than, they use uh, like beastly, unusual characters that you can't find in right. nature. So we'll get the dragon and the beast and mm -hmm. all these things in this book that'll come up and you, the descriptions are kind of these surrealistic horrific mm -hmm. things right. that's because the writer you know john is trying to say hey there's much more going on here mm -hmm. than just natural right things. right right okay so, so we we almost treat it as well it's just the way it is you know this is the way governments work around the world which, and corporations to be fair, and organizations it is though how it is work but it is not god's way well which is it's anti anti Antithetical. Antithetical. Antithetical, Antithetical to God's way. So I, that's a question that I actually have um, because we're talking about the white horse and we'll talk about the other ones. Mm -hmm. And those ones I can kind of see like, okay, you know, those are like, um, you know, the commentary that we had uh, about the white horse was that mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was evil and that, uh, or like an evil spirit of authoritarianism, right? But it's a white horse horse you right know? it's kind of like well th the devil comes as an angel of light right and like that's also the thing where it's like where do these horses i suppose come from are they well, bad okay. forces are they good forces like and but they say like you know they're coming from the thr throne uh, well or the seal is opened you know? by the lamb right and so the understanding in the book of revelation is that no matter what's happening in this world there is still the lamb who is controlling it all in the end. Okay. And ultimately, even evil things will turn out for good and will be used for God's kingdom purposes. Okay. 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 So it's not that um, God can use anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he has. And he will. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he used the death of his son on a cross, the most unjustified this, yeah, thing to justify us... Mm -hmm. Um, that's how the New Testament talks about it. If God used that, then he can, you know. Right. right. So so, it, so these things are not necessarily what, it, this, this is complicated. Um, this is not necessarily, um, well, he wants it, but it's not necessarily that he's God using uses, it as a. God uses it, God allows it, mm -hmm. but God does not will it to be the way it is. Right. Just like, um, and this is the complicating thing, just like, um. Well, why is the world in the mm -hmm. mess that it's in yeah, well, is can... really one of the questions is being asked in this chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, John is saying, well, here, here are the things that keep going on in history. Mm -hmm. And we think somehow they're in charge. 
actually, they're all going towards an end. And in the end, they're limited even in their ability to be in charge of everything. The pale horse, the mm -hmm. last horse, the jaundiced horse, we're mm -hmm. not quite sure what that color is. Right. Um, it's not white, so I'm thinking it's like, it's like you know, a dead corpse you know? thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the pale horse or jaundiced horse I can only um, handle a fourth, mm -hmm. right? And you'll see later on the bowls and stuff can only affect a certain amount of people. Right, There's yeah. limitations. Just like um, the book of Job. I know it's a weird um I mean, it's in analogy. the Bible, so... No, course, I'm saying you know. it's weird, you know, to throw that in mm -hmm. with this. It's in the... But uh, but um, God limited what the, Satan could do mm -hmm. to Job. You can't right. take his life. You can do these things, right. but you can't Just do a, this. Which is interesting that, you know, even in all of this, there's still a certain amount of, like, mercy that, you know, war, famine, authoritarianism, death... Right. They don't kill everyone. It does, yeah. They just say, okay, you can do this and no more. And they have right. to actually listen. You know? Right, right. So so that's, um, I think, the first mm -hmm. horse. And um, so on the one hand, <laughs> on the one hand, we're saying this is evil. These are not the way God wants. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, we're saying God allows and God will use. Which is a complicated thing to talk about. Yeah. And we could probably talk about this for hours for very, very dense theology. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I, I will say, though, that uh, just to kind of back up the point that we were making beforehand, uh, if you turn to Luke uh, chapter 1, uh, in there he, uh, Jesus is uh, saying, I think he's... Uh, this is in the week that he still has to live uh, on earth before he's crucified. He's saying, you know, this will happen and this will happen and this will happen. People will come in my name. There will be oh, yeah. war, earthquakes, famine, all that sort so of thing. So in all three of the synoptic gospels, mm -hmm. there's a, um, a uh, speech by Jesus called the eschatological mm -hmm. discourse. Sure. Okay. It's, it's really oh, the Greek word for the last times or the end times. Okay. And he compares the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD mm -hmm to what's going to happen at the end of the world. Right. And we'll see some of that description here in uh, Revelation 6 when we get to that the section we didn't read yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? That's basically a lot of the language is taken from Jesus' discourse mm -hmm. about what the end of the world is going to look like. Right, right, right. Okay. Right. Okay, okay let, the second horse, mm -hmm. um, that was the red horse, yes. right? Yes. Uh, right. He took basically peace from the earth so that people... Uh, would start slaying one another, basically right. war. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. Sadly, it's going on. Um, what? So, uh, Eugene Peterson writes mm -hmm. this: um, War is a red horse, bloody and cruel, making life miserable and horrid. It is the action of power-hungry persons. It's the delusion of insane pride. It is an expression of greed gone crazy. The perennial ruse is to glorify war so that we accept it as a proper means of achieving goals, but it is evil. It is opposed by Christ. Christ does not sit on the red horse ever. Right. So we're so used to it, I think, and we've justified it. And I'm not saying um, all the wars that we've ever done are not, um, you know, the United States or any. Um, right. Well, but World War II was pretty important to step in there. Too. Correct. Correct. No, you shouldn't do correct. that. Correct. But... Um, you know, and so there was uh, St. Augustine and others actually were once Christianity started to have more influence in the culture and was not just on the outside, uh, they came up with, with what is called just war theory. Okay. And it's really not to say that um, they never said war is wanted or mm -hmm. desired. Right. But you better um, understand um, when you need to do it. Mm hmm. Um, and not to justify yourself that it's, you know, sanctioned or right away. Mm -hmm. you, um, it is to defend. It is uh, of limited use, mm -hmm. right? It is, uh, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they went through it, but it's like, because the New Testament doesn't give us like, you know, go, and yeah. you cannot ever say, we're going in the name of Jesus Christ to fight a war. Well, we did that. It's called the Crusades. Uh, that well, didn't end well. <laughs> Yeah, it, that, but that was also a misunderstanding, and so mm -hmm. Augustine would never say you could do that. You just don't fight in the name of Jesus. Right, okay. A war. 
Well, it's just interesting because he does say that, you know, he is a conqueror and he is a ruler and he is the king of kings and warriors. Yeah, of but so he flips those words around. Okay, okay. You know? Explain. Well, Jesus said, you know, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 20, you know how the Gentiles act. They okay. lord it over each other, but not so among right. you. You want to be first, you'll be last. You want to be right. greatest, That's you'll true. be least. That's For the true. Son of Man did not come to be served, mm -hmm. but, but to serve, to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Right. So that is the focus of his, quote, reign, if you want to call it, is um, it's not like powerlessness, mm -hmm. but it, what it does, he uses his power for the sake of others. The people who, quote, reign in this world, like Caesars and dictators mm -hmm. and authoritarian figures, mm -hmm. They use power for the sake of self. Right, to keep at the expense of others. Yeah, the whole And war thing. is basically the worst example of that. It's basically okay. using power to kill others mm -hmm. at the expense of others. It's the ultimate way um, to do that. Okay. Okay. Okay, understood. Okay. All right. So um, so Jesus reigns in a completely different way than the kingdoms of this world. That's so true. So when he uses words of conquer and reign, mm -hmm. he guts them of the um, power mode and mm -hmm. adds in the love, love as the, the reason, sacrificial self-giving, right. et cetera. Right, right, right. Okay? Okay. So, um, yeah, war is not... Um, a thing to be treated lightly or to be used whenever we just feel like it, mm -hmm. that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Right? Absolutely. Um, the third one, then, um, that was the black horse. Uh-huh. And yeah. you were asking questions. Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales. I heard that seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a denarius. So just think of that, a quart of wheat for a day's wage for a hundred bucks. So, right, so let's say $15 an hour times what, eight. eight hours a day is 120 Twenty dollars for a quart of wheat. Yeah, that's, uh, that is really high price. Uh -huh. But then oil and uh, oil and wine, no problem. Yeah. Luxury goods in abundance, necessities in scarcity. Interesting, yeah. because wine is definitely a thing of like, you know, uh, rejoice and that sort of thing. And oil, I mean, I think yeah. nowadays we just kind of, you know, put it in the pan and, you know, maybe right. heat things but up. But back so. then, mm -hmm. oil and wine were luxury items. Right, right, right. Okay. Right. So um, Eugene Peterson says this, and mm -hmm. it's basically, look at the inequities. So you can find all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. that you don't need, but you can't find the stuff you really do need. Right, okay. And we see these inequities around the world, even right now, we've gone through the COVID pandemic mm -hmm. and countries, some of the country, I was just listening to um, uh, the news this morning about why Peru was hit so hard by um, COVID-19 mm -hmm. is because they did not have oxygen available oh, yeah. for a lot of places mm -hmm. yep. some of the basic necessities so the poorer countries end up with nothing mm -hmm. yep. to really save their people from mm -hmm. this pandemic but you know yeah same thing happened with india when like I don't yeah know, third wave hit or something right, like that right it was right. awful so um so it's kind of this inequities and we call it markets and all that we give it all sorts mm -hmm. of reasons for it but right. it's still not necessarily the best way to it's not the way god would want it set up mm -hmm. okay let's put it so uh eugene sa says famine is nature out of balance the necessities are scarce while the luxuries are mockingly in abundance greed does it people exploit the earth leaving it depleted and poor in order to get rich, the greed is glorified under the sacrosanct phrase, higher standard of living, and used to excuse everyday insanity. Famine is the condition in which we have most of what we don't need and almost nothing of what we do need. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were times in the Roman Empire, in fact, where um, one of the emperors um, said, hey, we need, uh, we got too many grapes. And so they were going to plow under half of the, the harvest okay. because uh, they wanted to prop up the, the, the price. Right. But wheat was scarce, and there were famines going on at the same time, and the people were so upset about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. We've done that before. I mean, we've had farmers pour out milk, and mm -hmm. um, we 
pay people not to produce mm -hmm. and yet there are places in this world that mm -hmm. need it yeah. right so yeah. um it is the way the world has been and the way it is and we think it's common that there's just going to be these types of inequities and everything's okay mm -hmm. the good news is the kingdom of god when it comes in its fullness everybody will have everything they need in abundance mm -hmm. Which is, and there will not be, and we'll be able to share it. I mean, we'll not you know, be kind of holding on to things. Which is really weird because that's not how this world this world works at all. Like, no, a lot of people would say, look, war certain times is necessary. Authoritarianism at certain points is necessary. You know, uh, capitalism and being able to like balance one with the other is necessary because that's just how the world works. You but know, what they are assuming is that human nature, with mm -hmm. our fallen state mm -hmm. and our conflict and our greed and our selfishness, mm -hmm. is always going to be the same. Right. That it's normal. In right. Sense, you know, we you know? have normalized mm -hmm. our pride and sin. Mm -hmm. Which is like, I mean, and I suppose... put it in, you know, and I, I get it. This is the best that we're going to yeah, have this in this it, world. You know, I'm not, in a sense. I'm not against capitalism. I'm not against all right, of this stuff. Right. I'm just saying it is not what God intended. Right. That's the thing. And it's not what's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, this that's stuff the thing. is going to end. It's weird because you know a lot of people are like, "Oh yeah, capitalism is great," and so like, yeah, if you look in the Word of God, though, at the end of days, there will be no such thing as capitalism well, because it doesn't exist anymore. You, you don't know? need it. Yeah. yeah well, it's kind of like um, you know, if the pavers in the kingdom of God are gold bricks. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? <laughs> well, that. But also, there's no such thing as like imbalance of anything. You know, like, it's going to be perfectly you know? in harmony again. But we're so used to it. That's yeah. what these things are so common. These four yeah. horses are so common. We're so used to. Mm -hmm. We don't even notice it anymore. Yeah, yeah, we don't notice. We're just like, well, how else are we going to live life if we don't do these yeah. things? You know. So, and then the finally the the uh, the fourth horse mm -hmm. is called is death. Right. Right. And um, this is how Lewis Brighton says it. The rider on the ghostly green horse. Okay. That's, it's a jaundiced, pale. You know, right. it's basically what, when somebody, you know. Basically like a skeletal horse. Symbolically sort of demonstrates that death is the result of tyranny, the bloodshed, and the famine of the first three horsemen, and that death together with the grave reigns on this earth. Right. And we have so gotten normal. Uh, well, I don't know if it's normal, but we have so hidden death mm -hmm. in our society. Um you, we don't deal with it, right? You know, you always much trying to at all. extend your life. You try to, you know. Well, and people die now. Um, you know, in the hospital, mm -hmm. not at home. I mean, there's so many different ways that we set it up in such a way. Now, the hospice movement has helped out mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. But so many ways that we almost anesthetize ourselves from thinking about it, mm -hmm. and then um, avoid even the mention of it, mm -hmm. so that we think somehow. You know, we're going to live like we're never, you know, my mortality, I don't mm -hmm. take into consideration. It's like right. e either Jesus is coming back before I die mm -hmm. or I'm going to die. Right. Right. And to be fair, plenty of people have thought, you know, oh, he might actually come while I'm alive. Statistically speaking, it hasn't happened yet. So, no. you know, it very so likely so, that we will all be dead by the time he actually comes uh, comes back. And, so the four know. horsemen are the normal things that are going on that keep going on. And you see through each of these cycles that we'll go through in the book of Revelation, they're saying this time between Christ's ascension into heaven, his uh, death and resurrection and his true victory and his appearing at the last mm -hmm. between these two, um, these four horsemen are happening. Mm-hmm. And this is the way the world is. It is not saying how wonderful it is by any means. We, I think, as Christians see clearly these things are not like things to celebrate or things to mm -hmm. um, to immortalize, you know. Right. Because um, it's not we're we're citizens of a different. Uh, place. We have a realistic understanding of uh, of and don't romanticize our culture, or our mm -hmm. world, or our nation, or anything. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I think that's important. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to get to uh, the fifth seal is open. Yes. All okay. right. So, and why don't you read that again? Um, uh, okay. Let's see. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw uh, uh, under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood 
on those who dwell on the earth. Uh, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, uh, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Okay. Okay. So this is the persecution of the church. Mm -hmm. And um, it, this is a uh, the fifth seal. It is not one of the four horsemen. No. But it is something that is um, faced by and um, Christians and another form of evil. So all of these things are different evils mm -hmm. that are happening in this world. Mm -hmm. And the persecution of Christians is another. And notice the Christians don't say, take up arms, don't fight back. Mm -hmm. They're just basically saying, okay, Lord, how long will this be until um, you right the wrongs that have been done? Um, and um, he goes like, don't worry. Mm -hmm. I got this. I got this. Mm -hmm. But he also gives him comfort. He says, okay, I'm going to give you robes. Rest. Right. So this, they're given you know? a robe of righteousness. Yeah. He doesn't so ignore them. Put it that way. Right. You know? So their robe of righteousness is not their own deeds. It mm -hmm. is the deeds of Christ. Right. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and we have to understand this is not, okay, so this is not a picture of heaven. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. This is a picture of the throne of God because... I don't believe, so if you're thinking, oh, well, you mean my um, the people who've died before me as Christians mm -hmm. are, are kind of semi in agony asking the question, how long, O Lord? Mm -hmm. And they're kind of in pain. No. This is just a description to understand, wait a minute, Lord, you're allowing, mm -hmm. you have allowed the persecution of your own people, mm -hmm. just as you allowed Jesus himself to be persecuted and killed. Right. And we are following in his train. Why are you doing that? Right. And he says, it's bringing to completion mm -hmm. what I have set up. I mean, you can still, like, you know, you can still be with the Lord and still see unrighteousness on the earth and be sad about it because you're now with the Lord. And this is like, this right, is, Right, but I don't you think know, you would actually, I I think this is just, you know, it's, right. it's asking that question. Right, fair so, enough. Because I don't think, you know... Uh, that's, you know, we speculate if we go, like, yeah, they can look down on earth and see what's, I don't right. think, I, they're so wrapped up. My dad says the same thing. He's like, they are they so wrapped up. To do. They <laughs> have, they are, they are so overjoyed mm -hmm. in the presence of God. Right. Why would they even bother? Yeah, why would they look back? It's like, yeah. I'm looking at the beauty of this. Why would I look at that little anthill? Right. You know? Right, right, right. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. So. so that's the fifth seal, okay. and that's going on through the entire time uh, between Christ's uh, um, reign and mm -hmm. ascension at the right hand of God to his second coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're finally getting to the sixth seal. Okay, then. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon uh, became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll uh, that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who was seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, uh, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? All right. So, um, what do you think this is about? Uh, well, that sounds pretty climactic, like kind of I the end so. of the world. It you is. Know? And so this becomes kind of the end of the cycle. Now, next chapter is still part of it. It's the other side of the vision okay. uh, with seeing the 144,000 um, and the great multitude, which mm -hmm. we'll get into next, uh, next session. But this is, and it's classic apocalyptic language about the end of the world. Okay. So Jesus uses, a, you know, the moon will turn blood red. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus uses some of this exact kind of language when he describes, like you said, in the Gospel of Luke mm -hmm. and in Matthew oh, okay, and okay. in Mark about the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And he's comparing the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world at the oh, same yeah, yeah, yeah. time yeah. in those passages mm -hmm. to help the Christians understand what's going to happen shortly as well as what's going to happen at the end and mm -hmm. uses 
you know, what happens in Jerusalem at 70 AD with its destruction mm -hmm. is going to be very similar to what happens at the end of the world. Right. So towards the end of this time period that we are living in between the death of Jesus Christ and resurrection, his reign now on earth, to the end end of the world when Christ comes in glory, um, there will be a time where things get worse before they get better. Yeah. Which is, you know, like, oh, oh boy, you know. But when we're talking this language, mm -hmm. this is like the last day. Yeah. This the is last like, few oh, moments. Shoot. You know, great earthquake, sun becomes black as mm -hmm. sackcloth, the full moon becomes red. Mm -hmm. It also reminds us of Judgment Day. Okay. Right? Not just then, but of Jesus on the cross. Remember what happens on oh, the cross? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So There's a great earthquake. Mm -hmm. And the sun. Darkness. Yep. For three hours, mm -hmm. his death, earthquake, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yep. Jesus faces that judgment day. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, yeah. Oof. Oof. So he faces it for us. So the Ooh, world will be, yeah, the world will be freaking out. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, while we yeah. can say, ah, our salvation is coming, mm -hmm. he's taking care of this for us. Well, and that's what the next chapter is going to describe who we are even while this is all going on, and how he has uh, redeemed us, and we get to celebrate it. Mm -hmm. So you're going to look at this passage, right? Well, I'm trying to it's actually... It's in Luke. Yeah, because... Uh, the coming of the Son of Man... Let I'm going to look at Mark 13, because that's okay. the one I know for sure where it exactly is. Okay. Well, I think he also says, like, you know... Um, again, I'm going to go to, to Luke 21, because that's the, the one that I know of right now. Yes. Um, you know, uh, set it therefore in your mind. Do not uh, meditate beforehand. Uh, let me see. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. He's basically, you know, saying, look, this is what will happen. But he's yeah. also saying, look, you're in, uh, by your endurance, you will gain your lives, which, you know... Um, but he's, I think he's also saying, like, look, this has to happen. Right. And... You know that it'll happen, but there's also an end to it. So don't right. be don't you know, be worried about it. Don't be worried about Here's it. Here's in Mark 13, verse 24 to 27. Okay. Okay. Uh, he says this. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened. Sound familiar? Okay. Yeah. And the moon will not give its light. Mm -hmm. The stars will fall from the sky. Yep. And the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time. Men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Mm -hmm. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Mm -hmm. That's the last day. Yeah. And that is exactly um, what this is describing here. Yeah, it right? is. It is. I mean, actually. it is so yeah. parallel, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so the four horsemen, the fifth seal as well, the persecution of his people will keep going through this time period. Then at the end, um, judgment day will come. Mm -hmm. And for this earth, it will be a day of destruction and despair. Mm -hmm. But for the people of God, we will see next week. Mm -hmm. It is a time of celebration and rejoicing right. because he is the one who has... Uh, called us and drawn us to himself, and by his grace we are saved. And so, uh, don't fear Judgment Day. Mm -hmm. It's already been take. It's taken place already because of the death of Jesus was right. your Judgment Day. Right. right. And right. when you believe, when you were baptized, you were united with Christ through death and resurrection. You've already been judged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And yeah. now he, he sees no, like, blame in no. you at all. So and you like, are wearing that you know, white robe of righteousness. So, you know, when I grew up, I always, uh, as a child, I kind of had this fear that the Judgment Day would be a day where this giant, you know, movie screen mm -hmm. fell out, you know, old technology, I right, guess. Right, right. Giant movie screen came down and... and the billions of people were before it, and mm -hmm. one by one, somehow, I don't ah, know yeah, time-wise, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. we'd stand before, and God would have the entire, our, all the shameful and uh, sinful and yucky things that we've right, ever right, done right, right. displayed on that screen, mm -hmm. and then at the end say, oh, but you're forgiven, right. and move on. Right. That is not a picture that you can find anywhere in the Bible. It is true, isn't it? Where it's like, huh. And Because your sins are forgiven already. God does not remember them anymore. Why would he bring them up on that last day? That's the thing. It's very passive judgment, if you would. You exactly. Know? <laughs> and judgment day is not a day. Uh, judge. So here's here's another clue for judgment day. The book of Judges. 
Do you know what that is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they weren't these pe- these uh, with wigs and gavel and right, you know, right, making right. a declaration. What were judges? They were basically people assigned by God in order to, to get rid of, well, like to declare to war, but to rescue yeah. God's people and uh, get rid of the enemies. Mm-hmm. That's Judgment Day. Mm-hmm. It's a day of rescue. Mm-hmm. It's a day of exodus. It's a day of um, where the world is judged. And we are saved. Which is still terrifying because, like, I, I would also right. kind of be like, if you were, like, Who's going to stand? Yeah, right? who, who, like, like so in the actual exodus, right. like, you know, hey, by the way, basically, you know, I don't know, uh, all the firstborns are dead. And right. now everyone is basically kicking you as quickly out of uh, right. Uh, that is exactly, possible. that is, so these are all the metaphors or all the actual stories in history that show what the end of history is mm-hmm. going to be like. And so here again, at the end of this chapter, like you said, it mm-hmm. is a terrifying day. Yeah. And for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Man. We're going to find out that next week. Mm-hmm. That's in chapter seven. We see who stands and who celebrates. No. And it's those who are saved by grace who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, who are in his righteousness. No. And we can celebrate that. Um, but I think that's it for today. I think so. Otherwise, we're going to probably keep going on and on and on forever. Yeah, so, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to pray us out then, Hugo. Thank you for your time. Sounds good. Lord God, um, this... Uh, wow, Lord. Um, what you have revealed in this chapter, you've exposed the rawness and the um, the fallenness, the brokenness of this world. We have so treated too common um, the, the issues of tyranny and war and famine and inequities and death. We act like they're, you know, <laughs> just normal. They've never been the norm. They've never been what you intend, but you still use them and you are still working through this time. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are the Lamb who was slain, who is worthy to unroll history and to make all of these bad things even work out for our good. We pray, Lord, that you would come soon. Come quickly. Come quickly. This world needs you. We are crying out for you. And we ask you to bless us now. Give us a faith to trust you in a chaotic times. Give us a, uh, uh, wisdom to see clearly what's going on around us and help us to live faithfully, to be present, to be uh, witnesses and effectively witnessing in this world, even while this world um, is going through and dealing with the, the unsealing of the seals. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for being with us today. It's great having you. We'll see you later.